The Primer, A Guide to the Truth, by Jivan David Budu. This book is my gift to humanity, and as such, will always be available free of charge to anyone willing to read it. Under no circumstances should any individual, group, or organization gain monetary profits from distributing this piece of literature. Chapter 3 How everything you learned so far resulted in the formation of the building blocks of life on Earth. Congratulations! For many of you, this is the part you've been anticipating. How did life begin on Earth? Let's start with the womb that had all the right ingredients to allow life to blossom, and that is our incredible planet Earth. Our sun formed roughly 5 billion years ago, and the Earth followed about 500 million years after. It is incredibly important for you to give this amount of time some thought in order to appreciate the scales of what we are about to discuss. 4.5 billion years isn't some blink of an eye, even on the scales of the universe's existence so far. The universe, at 13.8 billion years old, means the Earth has existed for almost one-third, 32.6%, of the total age that anything has existed. In order to gain an appreciation of how much time has passed since the Earth formed, I want you to imagine how much your life would change if I gave you $100, USD 2021. I bet your day would brighten up a good amount. We'll let each dollar also equal one year in our universe. Right now, you've been given the equivalent of a human life if you're really lucky. Now, imagine I gave you $12,000. That's a big day. Could be pretty life-altering for most of the human population. That's also the amount of years humans have been using agriculture slash farming to help us survive harsh seasonal changes. And if I were to be generous enough to give you $300,000, I think regardless of your level of wealth, your life would be significantly impacted. It just so happens that's approximately how many years humans, as we genetically recognize them today, have existed as a species. Now reflect on these two types of bank accounts. Use the financial bank account to gain a perspective on the number and an account of time to compare the scale. When you see how large the scales are, look at your account and you'll see I just deposited $4.5 billion. Do you think finances will ever be of any concern to you again? This is a number so large that people don't generally think of it numerically. Instead, they prefer the linguistic interpretation of $4.5 billion, as it is less taxing on the brain. But this mammoth, life-altering number in dollars represents the total time the Earth has existed. To put it another way, the Earth has existed 15,000 times longer than humanity. Why am I stressing the scale of time so fervently? Because humans have spent thousands of years lacking this perception. Part of the reason has to do with the evolution of the brain and what was necessary knowledge versus what wasn't for survival. The other more pertinent part, particularly today, is sheer laziness and the seeking of easy answers to gargantuan questions. Ask yourself, how much easier is it to believe the Earth only existed for as long as humans have kept historical records versus appreciating the full scale I'm describing? And without this sense of scale, the full majesty and miraculous nature of life can never be fully appreciated. For the next couple of chapters, this understanding of the scales of time will be very important. Anytime large timescales are being discussed, refer back to this analogy to gain a more comprehensive perspective. Returning to the formation of our planet, the Earth, as all planets do, started rather violently. Massive asteroids formed off the debris left behind by the remains of the Sun's formation disk collided and merged along a ring about 150 million kilometers from our home star. As the mass of this rock collection grew and gravity's influence increased, the form began to take the more spherical shape we recognize today. This slow process involved many collisions with both rocky and icy bodies called comets. Comets are what delivered a significant percentage of our water that allowed life to develop and thrive. At some point during this formation period, a planet forming in the same ring as Earth's smashed into our growing world. This added to the mass that gives our planet the gravitational force it has, but it also left a hefty amount of rocky debris blasted far enough from Earth 
and with enough of it that its gravity formed a separate spherical body. This body of fragmented planetary debris is what became our moon. Let's look at a few fun and important facts about the moon. As mentioned before, it is roughly 300,000 kilometers from the Earth. Unlike most large bodies orbiting stars, the moon does not rotate on its axis as the Earth does. It orbits the Earth and only shows one face to us. Was it always like this? Most likely not. Whatever rotational energy it might have achieved during its formation must have been countered by the plethora of asteroidal impacts it absorbed after. Take a look at its surface to garner an idea and imagine how many of those it absorbed for the Earth. Due to its gravitational influence, the comings and goings of our oceanic tides are caused. However, the most important aspect of the Moon from a human and life perspective is the stability it provides to Earth's orbit. You see, as the Earth orbits the Sun, the Moon orbits the Earth. The push and pull interaction between these three bodies actually keeps our planet's orbit more circular. This keeps our distance to the Sun remarkably constant. If not for this stabilizing factor, we may get too close to the Sun causing temperatures to skyrocket or drift away in a different part of the orbit putting an icy chill over everything. This stability the Moon grants us is one of the main reasons the delicate foundational molecules that form all life had the amount of time they had to come together naked in water before complete cells and eventually larger life forms could. Three cheers for the Moon! And we're back on Earth, where most of the violent collisions have ceased and the large land mass has settled into their gravitationally determined place, while hot magma erupted and flowed, causing the Earth to look like the metaphorical hell most humans imagine the underworld to look like. Much of the water is vaporized and existing as gas around the globe. The only thing preventing this water from escaping into space is the gravity of our planet. Over time, Mars was not so fortunate, being a smaller, less massive planet. Things did not stay this hellish forever. Over approximately 500 million years, the Earth slowly settled and cooled down. This cooling caused the water vapor to condense, producing the most spectacular rainfall our planet will ever experience, filling every ocean that makes our planet look blue from space, and covering 71% of the surface and rich ocean heaven. At this point in our tale of life, we are looking at Earth about 4 billion years ago. And before we take the next step, I must state, as I did with the beginnings of our universe, that there is no way any of us can know with 100% certainty how life formed on Earth. The way I approached developing my hypothesis was by studying and working with particle dynamics. What I do know is that my hypothesis for the molecular beginnings of life on our planet make incredibly accurate predictions for what we see today. So with that in mind, let's dive in. At this stage, Earth is lumps of rock with masses of oceans surrounding them. The rock is highly rich in minerals and everything needed to build life. Any water at this stage naturally contains a healthy amount of these life-giving atoms and simple molecules. Some scientists hypothesize life starting in the oceans, but I disagree. Molecules of life likely needed a more stable, smaller body of water to prevent them from becoming destroyed with ease before they could fully mature. For these reasons, it would be a pond or lake or maybe a calm sea that would be a more suitable womb. These smaller bodies would be less turbulent during rough climate fluctuations. Remember, more likely, not guaranteed. To simplify things, we return to our favorite tool, abstraction. Picture a nice pond. There are no plants or animals in this little body of water, just dark rock formed from solidified lava. Into this pond, I want you to dump thousands of pieces of Lego. To simplify things, only have two different types of pieces. This Lego will be extremely light in mass and therefore weight. This means that unless the water remains perfectly still for a very long time, the pieces are always floating and moving about. The Lego also bonds really easily together, but they also break apart with relative ease as well. The pond is always being agitated by wind and sometimes storms or rain. There should be enough Lego in the pond so the pieces are constantly interacting with each other. The last thing is that just as in real life, the more circles slash pegs of a piece that attach, the stronger the bond and the longer it will last. 
and we're off. When I run this abstraction, the beginning is pure chaos. Lego pieces are constantly bumping into each other, forming mostly weak bonds, and then they are bumped apart by other pieces. In this chaos, you'll see a few pieces here and there that form full peg attachments, and they stay together much longer than the ones not fully bonded. Due to the chaos, however, even these don't last forever. Things keep going this way as we let the experiment run. A windstorm breaks out and the water gets much more turbulent. Even full bonds struggle to hold on for more than a few seconds. The wind subsides and things return to the status quo. Minutes after things calm down, you notice four pieces bonded together. This new configuration resists being broken no matter how many pieces bump into it. We let the experiment run for a few days and come back to see what progress has been made. The conditions were stable while you were away, and we find many of these four-piece structures floating in our pond. It looks as though half of all the pieces are in this configuration. There's even a new structure that formed of the four-piece configurations. These consist of six of the four-piecers, and man do they look sturdy. Nature does her due diligence, and a tremendous thunderstorm thrashes the pond. The individual four-piecers are all obliterated in the violent event, but the new six stack is completely intact. When the storm ends, it is the only structure left standing. We leave the experiment for three months, and when we come back, 90% of the pieces are now in the form of the six stackers. The first question I'll ask you is, did any piece of Lego act with conscious intent? Of course not. Lego, like particles, are at the mercy of their environment. What was the only reason the pond eventually became filled with six stackers? Exactly, because nothing the environment could do to it caused it to break apart. After we gave the experiment enough time, the natural thing to see is the most advantageous structures of the available building materials to withstand the pressures of the environment and dominate through its abundance. Just as stars, planets, and black holes dominate the environment the universe provided, so do the six stackers in our pond universe. The same fundamental principles apply, even if the conditions are different. The environment determines what lasts and what doesn't. Chaos, time, and the nature of the building materials grant the number of options from which the environment will select. And here again we see that the stimulus dictates the response. The foundational stimulus being the weather influencing the water and its turbulence, which in turn moves the pieces around. If the water remained perfectly still, there would be no structures to speak of, just a pile of single pieces at the bottom of the pond. If there were a storm every day, you might have to wait years or longer to reach the same result of six stackers dominating the environment. Based on these fundamental principles, this is how life started on Earth. A body of water, rich with atomic energy, left to bond together and be tested for millions of years, possibly hundreds of millions of years, eventually forming structures the environment could not easily destabilize. Amino acids appear to be the first types of molecular structures that formed. You can compare atoms to particles and amino acids to atoms to relate back to chapter 1. From a human perspective, amino acids are a much more understandable building block, but you can now see all of the building blocks with your newfound knowledge. Keep in mind that millions of years is a really long period of time. The sheer number of possible molecular configurations that can occur with the atoms and molecules available during this primordial period are astronomical. At some point, we get to the most important molecule to all life that has ever existed on our planet, and that is DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, or, as I like to call it, God. DNA has been hypothesized to look like a very long ladder that has been twisted until it looks like a spiraling staircase. Every living cell of every living thing that has ever existed on Earth received the instructions that built and maintained it from DNA. The process of replication is coming into debate due to errors in imaging cells that need to be investigated more. We know that cells divide, as does the DNA within it. I will not speculate at this point on the process until I have more conclusive information. When I have a solid answer, I will update the book and share the mechanical process for you all. With regards to replicating DNA, we are talking about roughly 3 billion segments within each molecule of DNA, 
and the accuracy is beyond remarkable during replication, with an error rate of only 1 in 10 billion. If it were not as accurate, errors or mutations would prevent any stable species from developing. The earliest we can find any fossilized cell structure containing DNA is between 4 to 3.8 billion years ago. So how did DNA become encapsulated within a linked chain of amino acids and other compounds? There is no certain answer yet, and maybe there never will be. My hypothesis goes as follows. DNA interacts with amino acids by linking with them as both molecules are floating within a medium. At the time we're discussing, that medium was water. When an amino acid connects with a strand of DNA, it gets modified by the instructions slash code in that segment of the life-giving molecule. Upon its release, the newly modified amino acid interacts with its environment differently than before due to its new molecular structure. So if you have an abundance of a particular amino acid that becomes modified by a dominant molecule of DNA, causing it to connect with the other identical modified amino acids, then naturally, with enough time, these would form a chain that would eventually surround our life-giving molecules. Just keep in mind that this didn't all happen over a short period of time. There must have been innumerable failures before the big moment occurred. This process of modifying available amino acids that build the structures of this foundational cell is how all of the other parts that make up every cell came to fruition. And every life form is a descendant of one single cell and the biological components that molecule of DNA coded for. This cell, and the DNA that coded for it, was so exceptional that it kept this entire process going while the environment relentlessly tested its mortality for almost 4 billion years so that you could be born and be given the gift of experiencing life today. It has survived asteroid impacts, ice ages, and who knows the amount of incredible obstacles the universe threw at it. Yet nothing could permanently erase our beautiful God molecule. The first time I fully realized how important and miraculous DNA really is, I couldn't stop being grateful for it. I then realized that this divine spark resides in every living thing, and the only reason it survived is that it kept adapting through replication and the mutations the environment selected for, across every locale on our planet, for billions of years. And within its codex is the memory of the entire journey that one can extrapolate to varying degrees as you begin to understand the processes that led to its creation, how it functions, and how it responded to ever-changing environmental stimuli. When we look out into our solar system, our galaxy, and over the most recent history, the universe, there is no clear evidence that life exists beyond our world. In our solar system, with its nine planets, yes, nine, shout out to Pluto, even though we haven't been able to do thorough exploration yet, there is again nothing as remarkable as DNA. The molecules we found are simple and don't approach the intricate complexity and durability DNA has shown. Clearly, life isn't popping up in every region of space, which shows that on a grand scale, the universe is pretty hostile to life like ours. We are so lucky and we need to fully appreciate this in order to maximize life's potential, not just for the individual, but our entire species and the life entrusted to our stewardship. From a solar system perspective, dangers that threaten the existence of all of DNA's creations are grossly abundant. Billions of asteroids and comets encircle the entire two light year span of our solar neighborhood. If not for the massive gravity of our four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, absorbing the majority of these dangers potentially heading our way, life probably would not have made it as far as your existence. If our sun were not as stable as it is, life on Earth could have been radiated away eons ago. Venus, our neighboring sibling planet, is incredibly similar to our home world. Unfortunately, its closer proximity to the sun means it's too hot to have liquid water on the surface. In fact, it is too hot to keep lead in solid form even though lead melts at 327.5 degrees Celsius. Mars lacks the mass slash gravity to keep the water it once had from evaporating into space. Any chance for life to form there had a very limited window to do so compared to Earth. Interestingly, these three planets formed in very close proximity to each other and had access to a reasonable amount of the same types of atoms that our Sun didn't consume. 
and yet their distance to the sun and the amount of mass they collected meant only one of them could achieve life that has existed for four billion years. The stimulus dictates the response. As you can see, life requires quite a lot in order for it to get to the stage our planet has. The closing of this examination of the universe and life from this atomic stage is to understand that after nearly four billion years of evolution, DNA carried the code that allowed for its own creations to understand itself. In essence, DNA evolved to understand itself through humanity. To go even further, DNA is constructed of atoms, which are made of particles. Since particles are simply tiny excitations of the medium that is the universe, that means that by understanding all of this, you are the universe understanding itself. In essence, the universe has achieved consciousness through our species. I'll let you ponder over that, and I will see you in the next chapter.